Revolution and its repercussions, Marx and Mao or Montaigne. Let's turn to two texts that you read, Ho Chi Minh's On Revolutionary Morality and Nguyen Mentung's excerpts from An Excommunicated. But before we turn to those, let's talk a little bit about the tension between the individual and the collective. So this is a classic tension in political philosophy. This conflict uh, between the individual and the collective is perhaps the tension that political philosophy explores. You know, what should we value more or how should we balance these two values? The study of politics arguably begins with the Apology of Socrates and its accompanying dialogue, Crito. I hope you've all read these or will read them. Uh, they're pretty foundational to Western philosophy. So the Apology is a famous defense of the individual against the collective, and the Crito is the opposite. The Crito is the defense of the collective against the individual. In the Apology, Socrates defends himself in a trial uh, he's proudly defiant, arguing that he wants to wake up a tired and sluggish polity. You know, Athens, the people of Athens are lazy in their thinking, and so he says he's a gadfly, provoking the people into interrogating their own assumptions and beliefs. But a few weeks later in the Crito, we see Socrates make the case against himself. So his friend Crito is trying to sneak him out of prison, but Socrates says, no, I shouldn't run away, I should die, because the people of Athens voted on it, and justice demands that he follow through, because he owes everything, himself, his life, to the laws of Athens. So he owes everything to society. Without society, uh, Socrates would be nothing. So since then, thinkers, at least Western thinkers, have debated over whether the individual or collective is more important and how they might be reconciled. So Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher, says, uh, writes, from 600 BC to the present day, philosophers have been divided into those who wish to tighten social bonds and those who wished to relax them. Now, you read a brief excerpt uh, from one of his uh, Ho Chi Minh's writings titled On Revolutionary Morality. So let's turn to that. It's a pretty straightforward text, right? Ho Chi Minh starts off by saying that since the beginning of time, humans have needed other humans to survive. Individuals must join society to survive. You're nothing on your own. You are fundamentally a social creature. So therefore, for the Vietnamese to kick out the French colonizers, they need to come together to unify as one. And in order to unify into something powerful, the Vietnamese should get rid of individualism. For Ho Chi Minh, individualism means caring about yourself more than uh, others, caring more about your own honor and position instead of the people. Uh, basically, individualism is being selfish, uh, concerned with the self more than others. So here Ho Chi Minh is uh, clearly inspired by Mao Zedong's essay, Combat Liberalism. So in it, Mao writes, liberalism is extremely harmful in a revolutionary collective. It is a corrosive, which eats away unity, undermines cohesion, causes apathy, and creates dissension. It robs the revolutionary ranks of compact organization and strict discipline, prevents policies from being carried through, and alienates the party organizations from the masses which the party leads. It's an extremely bad tendency. Liberalism stems from petty bourgeois selfishness. It places personal interests first and the interests of the revolution second, and this gives rise to ideological, political, and organizational liberalism. So instead, Ho Chi Minh argues, the Vietnamese should care about the revolution instead of their individual selves, and they should devote their lives to the revolution. So Ho Chi Minh learned from Marx and Lenin, uh, so he thinks that human societies, whether they like it or not, develop through stages of history. So this is Marx and Engels' theory of historical materialism. So. Uh, 
uh, primitive tribal societies, slave societies, feudal societies, capitalist societies, and the final stage will be a communist society. So this is their theory of how history moves and progresses. So each stage of history, each of these societies, has within it a class conflict, except for the first one. So tribal society is more or less egalitarian, kind of a primitive communism, but uh, slave society is kind of the first class society. So uh, in slave societies, the masters exploit slaves, and the slaves will get more and more miserable, and the conflict between slaves and masters will get worse and worse until there's a violent revolution, and then that relationship will be abolished. And this will give birth to a feudal society where you have lords exploiting peasants, and the peasants will get more and more miserable, and the conflict between peasants and lords will get worse and worse until there is a violent revolution and that relationship will be abolished. And this will give birth to a new society, a capitalist society, where you have the capitalist class uh, exploiting the proletariat working class, and the working class will get more and more miserable, and the conflict between the classes will get worse and worse until there's a revolution where that relationship will be abolished, and this will give birth to communism where there is, where there are no classes, and which is the final stage of history. So uh, these internal contradictions playing out, uh, erupting into revolution, uh, will it will lead humanity to progress. So Ho Chi Minh and other communists think that the time is ripe for a revolution to a communist society. And that's kind of a key phrase, that the time is ripe, right? So Che Guevara famously said, the revolution is not an apple that falls when it is ripe. You have to make it fall. But the apple should still be ripe. That's how it can fall more easily. So um, Ho Chi Minh wants the Vietnamese to cultivate themselves so that their personal desires are the same as the collective's revolutionary desires. So here's that quote again about remolding the self. So that's Ho Chi Minh in a nutshell. Uh, he prefers the community over the individual. But we can imagine negative consequences from this way of thinking, right? So think about the problems that might come from emphasizing the collective too much at the expense of the individual. So let's turn to Nguyen Man Tung, a Vietnamese thinker who provides an alternative view from Ho Chi Minh. So whereas Ho Chi Minh is inspired by Marx and Lenin, Nguyen Man Tung is, is inspired by Michel de Montaigne. And argues that the individual is ultimately more important than the community. So Nguyen Man Tung was born in 1909. He was a well-respected revolutionary, and he studied law in France, and he fell in love with French literature. And in the 1950s, he got in trouble with his own Communist Party. So in 1954, the Vietnamese Communist Party implemented land reforms. So they basically took land from landlords and redistributed it, redistributed it to poor peasants. But in this process, innocent people uh, and landlords who turned out to be as poor as anybody else were humiliated and executed. And the party recognized these mistakes and undertook a program to rectify errors. So they said to intellectuals, you are welcome to criticize us. So it was kind of like the 100 flowers movement in China, same thing, like this self-criticism. So they admitted, we made mistakes, so uh, give us your criticisms. We want to improve and learn from our mistakes. So Nguyen Man Tung agreed, and he gave a speech where he criticized the party for its lack of democracy and lack of the rule of law to protect individual rights. Well, it turns out that the communist, for the Communist Party, this criticism was a bit much, a bit too much. So they excommunicated Nguyen Man Tung. They didn't imprison him, they 
excommunicated him. So that anyone who associates with him will get in trouble uh, by the communist authorities. So as you can imagine, this disillusioned him to the Communist Party. For Nguyen Man Tung, the party had become too dogmatic. While communist culture forms man for the revolutionary struggle, it is not enough for a human being. The solution then is to include intellectual culture, which forms man for thinking and study. But the communist culture must not annihilate intellectual culture. Between these two cultures can be peaceful coexistence and better yet, a beneficial collaboration for the respective interests of the two groups and for the entire people. The Communist Party's commitment to their truth, uh, Dung thought, led them to think that anyone who questions the party's truth was not only wrong, but hostile, even after the party allowed criticism. So paranoia set in and the party saw enemies where there actually were none. So what the Vietnamese need, uh, Dung thinks, is freedom of expression, freedom of expression is a human right, he argues, and can be learned from the West. The West has offered the East a technique and conception of human rights concerning the moderation and diversity of people's ways of thinking and living. Furthermore, Tung criticizes the unreflective favoring of socialism over capitalism, uh, relegating this to mere Logomachy, which means an argument over words. So he's going to say the only thing that matters are not words, but the needs and happiness of the people. Let us not kill ourselves over words, going to the extreme of a ridiculous logomachy. The terms capitalism and socialism have no meaning by themselves, but depend on the tastes and preferences of those who use them. In the mouth of a socialist, according to a habit which is not only inveterate, but no less ridiculous and childish, one calls capitalists all that one hates, and whoever has been given such a certification of infamy, his fate is done. Notice that in the text that you read of Nguyen Man Tung, uh, he starts the same way as Ho Chi Minh. Uh, he says that since the beginning of time, individuals have needed society, needed the collective to survive. Physical needs are satisfied by the community, but individuals also have spiritual needs which the community cannot satisfy, he thinks. Individuals need an arrière boutique. So this is a famous line from Michel de Montaigne, an ar uh, Area boutique is a back shop, uh, and communism does not allow individuals to have back shops, so like a private mental space to think your own thoughts. The communists have deprived uh, Nguyen Man Tung of teaching generations of intellectuals, of French ideas and wisdom, he says. And he's asked, how has French culture affected, uh, how has French culture affected his attitudes towards politics and communism? And he says that Montaigne can teach the Vietnamese to think for themselves, to engage diversity of ideas and opinions and to form one's own judgments rather than submitting to authority or parroting others. So when the communist authorities knocked on his door to tell him he would be uh, excommunicated, he thought he was going to be sent to prison for the rest of his life. So he took only one book with him, and it was Michel de Montaigne's essay. So here is Professor Brunstetter's 405-year-old copy of Montaigne's essays from 1616. I took a picture of it when I was at his house. Uh, and Nguyen Man Tung writes, I open Montaigne. It is my breviary, my resources for the last sacrament. 
sacrament. There are so many good lessons that the communists can learn if only they had some culture from the essays. By way of the sane examples of the elders and of Montaigne, they could have learned that one should not lodge anything in one's head by just authority and on credit, that anyone following another does not follow anything. Translated into clear language, this means that one must not kneel before anybody, neither Marx nor Lenin, neither Stalin nor Mao. So here he is just quoting Montaigne, you know, pulling quotes from Montaigne and using them. He continues, they must neither shut themselves up nor lock themselves in a closed world, but open themselves to the commerce of men, rub and sharpen our minds against that of another person, enter into this vast world, scrutinize where we should look for to find out good points of views. And thus, with the pieces borrowed from others, one must transform them and mix them up in order to turn them into one's own work, namely one's judgment. The gain of our study is to become better and wiser. There, in brief, is what the communists should have learned in order to form themselves before governing others. So, if we can go back to Socrates, which Socrates, that of the Apology or the Crito, do you think is more correct? For Ho Chi Minh, the Socrates of Crito would be right. The community is more important than the individual. Ho Chi Minh writes, our era being a civilized revolutionary era, one must rely all the more on the force of the collective of society in all undertakings. More than ever, the individual cannot stand apart, but must join the collective, join society. Therefore, individualism goes counter to collectivism. Collectivism and socialism will certainly prevail, while individualism will surely disappear. However, for Nguyen Man Tung, the Socrates of the Apology is right. The individual is ultimately more important than the collective. He writes, Since Socrates, we know that when the city wants to condemn an intellectual to drink hemlock, it accuses him of corrupting the youth. Communism has therefore revived a practice that dates back more than two millennia. Historically, the autocracy has dreamed of molding the people, especially the youth who bear the future in its image. As a result, they are educated with every political line. The school is charged with the mission of training those who tomorrow will assume their responsibilities in the city. It is therefore important that the teacher trains his students to become executors of government policy. Any deviation committed in education has the same gravity as a deviation from the political line proclaimed by the leaders. In short, in Ho Chi Minh and Nguyen Man Tung, we see how two Vietnamese thinkers make sense of this classic tension between individualism and collectivism. And this tension, of course, will later play out on the world stage during the Cold War between so-called free market capitalist countries, which claim to value individualism, and so-called communist countries, which claim to value collectivism. I won't have uh, time to go uh, much into the second Indochina war known as the Vietnam War to Americans and known as the American War to Vietnamese, or the Resistance War against America. But for many Vietnamese on the side of the Northern Communists, the war was a war of uh, liberation from colonial and imperial rule. And for many Americans and for Southern Vietnamese anti-communists, that war was a war against the spread of communism in Asia. So where does this leave us today? In Vietnam, on April 30th, 1975, Northern Communists took over Saigon and won the Vietnam War, reunifying the country under communist rule. And on that day, thousands of Vietnamese who did not want to live under communist rule fled the country, many on boats. And my father is on this boat that you see right here. The captain was my great uncle, my grandfather's brother. So my dad recently got a tattoo of the boat that he left Vietnam on and, and um, it has the South Vietnam flag and the date that he left Vietnam when he was 16 years old. Um, to, earlier we mentioned that 
we see um, South Vietnamese flags, the yellow flag with the three red stripes, at many pro-Trump rallies in the United States and also at the riots at the U.S. Capitol. Why? Well, I would point you to uh, two uh, interesting articles uh, that you should Google and uh, read. Um, but in short, many Vietnamese who were refugees from the war support Trump because they think that he is anti-communists and uh, they, some of them think for some reason that the Democratic Party uh, are authoritarian communists. And um, for some of them, in a way, it's as if they're fighting the Vietnam War all over again. So this perceived tension um, between individualism and collectivism manifests in other ways as well. So consider the COVID-19 pandemic, which has uh, disrupted all of our lives. Um, in, in the United States, over 400,000 people have died from the virus. And in France, um, about 68,000 people have died. Uh, so far in Vietnam, 35 people have died from COVID-19 uh, as of January 19. Uh, it sounds unbelievable, but these numbers are affirmed by locals and Western medical advisors in the country. Uh, as you can see here, the poster says, working together to fight COVID-19. The Vietnamese government says on its websites that the reason Vietnam, Vietnam is successful in controlling the pandemic uh, is due to its adherence to Ho Chi Minh thought, his anti-individualism, his collectivist spirit, uh, that they fought the virus in the same way they fought the United States and France in the 20th century. And some Western commentators like this um, former French ambassador to Vietnam think that collectivist attitudes are useful at times like these and that the individualism of the West is doing harm. The Asian countries, more precisely the countries of Confucian culture, have so far succeeded in stemming and containing the wave that we are all taking head on. In the Confucian world, in Vietnam as in Korea, in Japan as in the Chinese world, China, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, the defense and the interests of the group prevail over the rights of the individual. A lesson in the obvious. In the face of adversity, a tight-knit, disciplined, and if possible, well-led group always prevails over a mass of autonomous individuals who are resistant to authority. An eternal lesson. So yes, our individual freedoms are priceless, and the Confucian model willfully puts aside individual freedom if it means safeguarding the collective interest. But let's remember, collective interests and individual freedom have coexisted harmoniously in France. What we used to call civic sense was nothing more than respect by all of collective rules for the good of the whole population. This is not Confucianism, but we are approaching it. This civic sense, special attention paid to the community, has largely disappeared, replaced by the new injunction, it's my right, driven by claims of countless minority groups. If we do not find this subtle compromise between collective purpose and individual space that was our strength until the early 80s, I fear that we will have no other choice but to see the disciplined Confucian countries continue to beat us on all plans. So to the question, individualism, so freedom and autonomy for the individual, or collectivism, solidarity and community, um, uh, I would suggest that we need to balance them. A political theorist has given a nice analogy. So by the way, that was, uh, here's the French original. Um, the history of the last century teaches us that in the ideological world, there are few victories and defeats. As circumstances change, ideas plunge and surface. A captivating image of this reality is offered by Michael Frieden who uses the analogy of pieces of furniture arranged in a room, each time in a different order according to the owner's taste. At times, freedom or autonomy occupy the central space. At others, they are shoved to the background, replaced by other ideas like solidarity or community. Some balance between the old and the new will save us from making the most dangerous mistake of all, 
taking ideas, attractive as they may be, to their logical ends, or to carry on the analogy, emptying the room of all but one kind of furniture. Lastly, uh, and I'll end on this, could we, Westerners, learn from Asians in the 21st century, just as Asians learned from Westerners in the early 20th century? What ideas from different cultures can we use to address problems of democracy, of racism, of security, of climate change? Different cultures, different countries have different ideas, different ways of understanding the world. Perhaps we, Americans or French, can learn from others or from each other. The traffic of ideas continues. So, which roads or highways should we take? <laughs>